I'd like to, you to know that this has been a rough couple of weeks for um, some people that I know. Um, in my life, uh, with close friends and family, there have been four deaths within the last couple of weeks. And uh, um, Troy is not here, as I mentioned before. He's up at the hospital visiting his mom and looking after her. We inhabit a world that is broken. And there is sadness, and there's failure. The more we plan, the more we can see all the possibilities of failure. We can try and come up with solutions and for problems that will never come to pass. And we'll encounter failures that we can't even foresee. And all throughout the, the history of the Bible, all throughout the Bible... It tells us that more and more chaos happens the further we get away from, cre from creation. From first sin and the fall of the first couple, there are failings and fallings of people, failures of chosen ones, God's nation through Abraham, Saul, David, Solomon, the northern and southern kingdoms, all had major failures and shortcomings. The Bible is packed full of things, set as examples of things we need to remember so that we don't set our hearts on things as the people the Bible did. All the way from cover to cover, there are so many things we can learn. We can learn a lot of things to do and a lot of things not to do how to treat others and ourselves, how to live in a world consumed by itself, and how to stand up for Christ. In the Gospel of John, we see Jesus as he turns the world upside down. Let's read John chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and, uh, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting, sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He turned the coins of the money changers and overturned, or he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will, raise it in, I will raise it again in three days. They replied, 
It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. As I said before, the Gospel of John really turns God's kingdom upside down. We can see that in major form here in chapter 2 as Jesus shares his humanity with us. The Lord God Almighty, as a man, came here to earth to show us his love. The creator of everything listened to his mama. I do have a confession. Um, I do not like to preach. But there are times when we do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Jesus' mom said, jump. And he said, but mom, I don't want to. Jesus came to this earth to serve not to be served. He was humble enough to be obedient, even obedient to his mama. There were plans made by the wedding party, and those plans were going great up until the point when they ran out of wine. Our planning is good and all, but so many times we come up short or totally off target, not seeing the obstacles in our way. But Jesus gives us another directive, to not place our stock in ourselves, but to put Jesus first. Jesus wasn't just a prophet. He was put here by God to give us a different way. Not just put here by God, but was God in the flesh. But that's not all. God has given us his spirit. Jehovah Jireh, God Almighty, the creator of all things, lives inside of us. But it keeps going. He has saved the best to last. It is quite prophetic that Jesus saved the best to last. All throughout history, God shows us how good things are when we live with him. When Jesus comes into view, we learn how to be servants. We also learn how to treat God. As we see in Matthew... Christ didn't come to abolish any, of the law, abolish any of the laws, but came to fulfill them. Jesus continued to love God with everything he had. He wasn't allowing himself or anyone else to defame, defile, or deny God's sovereignty. As we can see in the second part of John 2, the religious people had their dedications all mixed up. They were intent on serving themselves. Last year, we walked through the entire Bible, and we saw, uh, even recently, how the priests were to be cared for. I suppose that the priests of the time thought that since Rome overtook their land, they could justify getting payment in a different form. They charged the people and they did all this with the wrong motives. 
they got things out of order. They were looking to fulfill themselves rather than to serve God. God wasn't first, so the best went to the last. Jesus clearly couldn't stand for that. We can see that when we get our things mixed out of order, us first and God second, we really get out of line. Jesus shows us that we need to put others first, but God firstest. We should really be jumping into action like Jesus or those servants who did what Jesus said to do. Jesus told them what to do. And they didn't, they didn't think it was crazy. They just went ahead and did it. We should not put ourselves first and put things in front of God. Let us instead run the race with perseverance. Because after this life, we have more life. The best is yet to come. While I was in classes for preaching, uh, or for ministry, rather, in several different classes, they said, don't apologize for the things you say or how you say them, but I'm going to. I'm not a preacher. I'm a minister, yes, but I don't feel that I'm gifted in wordcraft or presenting a long, drawn-out thought. That's why we pay Troy. But sometimes we do what's right because it's the right thing to do. When we choose to let God be first, when we choose to have God first, our lives will be turned upside down. And it's no longer the last that will be last. God will be first. And when we get out of the way, greater things will come than we can imagine. So I'll close with this nice and short lesson. If you're turned around and want to be turned upside down and want to dedicate or rededicate your life, come forward as we stand and sing.